Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about morality and religion. Let's go ahead and get started. So the reading we're going over today comes from the book The Fundamentals of Ethics by Russ Schaefer Landau, a contemporary philosopher. The primary th question that he's exploring in this reading is the question, does morality depend on religion? Now, in his view, he thinks that the common response to this is yes, that in some way morality does depend on religion. And he looks to the billions of people that see religion as the most popular source for morality. In troubling times, where do they go? They go to sacred scriptures. They go to, uh, to religious leaders such as priests and imams and so on. So the question is, is this accurate? Is it true that morality does depend on religion in some way? Well, he says that there are three basic assumptions to this view, and he wants to critically assess them throughout this reading. The first assumption is that religious belief is needed to get us to do our moral duty. The second assumption is that morality must be created by someone, and God, by far, is the best candidate for the job. Now we should note when he's writing this chapter, he is focusing on these monotheistic traditions, although a lot of the same concepts can also apply to other traditions as well. The third assumption is that religious wisdom is the key to providing us with moral guidance. Let's look at each one of these in turn. Uh, we'll see that Schaefer Landau explores these, each of these assumptions in some detail, giving some arguments uh, is for the most part against uh, these uh, three notions. So let's see what he has to say. So the first assumption, that religious belief is needed for moral motivation. This states that without a belief in God, people are more likely to stray from the path of virtue. Well, why? Well, a couple reasons here. First is fear of God, fear of eternal punishment, fear of hell, right? Going to the bad place. You want to do what God tells you to do, what you want to do what is right, because otherwise you're risking eternal punishment. On the flip side, there is also eternal reward, the good place, heaven. So if you want to get to the good place, well, you're going to do what God asks you to do. You can see there's a lot of similarities to what we've talked about previously with Pascal's wager. So the idea here is that if you are religious, you're more likely to do what you think is right to, for these rewards and to avoid these punishments. And more, uh, if you're not religious, you're not going to have those same incentives to do what's right. Schiffer Lando offers a couple objections to this point of view. First, he says that even if true, this would only show that the religious are more conscientious. They're more likely to do what they think is right. So the question is, is that what they think is right, what their religion tells them to do, is that actually what's right? He says this doesn't mean you're more likely to do good because those principles that you're given in any particular religion, this assumption doesn't say anything about those. They could be telling you to do terribly misguided things. He gives the example of the Inquisition, the torturing of individuals because they don't believe the same thing, thing that you do. Today, we consider that terribly wrong, which hopefully we all can agree to. Uh, but at a time, this was accepted as a part of being pious, being following religious codes. There's many other examples. You can think of uh, things like the Crusade and so on. Uh, so the idea here is that this doesn't settle that tell us that we're actually doing what's right. It just tells us we're going to follow what our religion tells us to do. He then says that, well, let's put that issue to a side for a moment. And by doing so, we can and assume that the moral principles are good in your particular religion. You're not being asked to torture people. You're not being asked to murder individuals because they don't believe in your God or your beliefs and so on. Assume that your moral principles are good. They perhaps focus on compassion, love, helping others, and so on. He says there's still another issue that this gives us 
a faulty motivation, a wrong motivation, that you're doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. You're doing what you think is right, not because you love God or out of respect for the moral law, but instead out of self-interest because you want those rewards, you want to avoid those punishments. Your main motivation is, uh, is all self-centered. So even if assumption one is correct, that assumption that, well, you need religion for, to do what is right, to give you motivation to do, follow uh, commandments and so on. If that's true, it seems to undermine moral character rather than support it. Because that means that people have to be selfishly motivated to do correct actions. He says, instead, people should do their duty, do what's right for its own sake. Do what's right because it is right, not for these ulterior selfish motivations. All right, so that's assumption one and some arguments against assumption one. Now let's move to assumption two. To help explain assumption two, consider the following question. So imagine a godless universe. So imagine a universe that God does not exist. In fact, no deities exist whatsoever. All religions are wrong on that fact. So the question is, where do moral laws come from? What is the foundation to those? Why do what is right? So the assumption here is that there needs to be a foundation to moral laws. Otherwise, moral laws are meaningless. So in a godless world, moral laws have no weight. There's no authority behind them. So this assumption states that God is the creator of morality, and some go as far to say that God has to be the creator of morality. To explain this, let's look at what Schaefer Landau calls the argument for God's creation of morality. Schaefer Landau's summary of this argument goes as follows. One, every law requires a lawmaker. Two, therefore, the moral law requires a lawmaker. Three, humans cannot be the author of the moral law since we are imperfect in so many ways. Four, if humans cannot be the author of moral law, then God is the author. Five, in the conclusion, therefore, God is the author of the moral law. This argument states that not only is God the creator of morality, but God has to be the creator of morality. Moral laws require lawmakers, and God seems to be the only uh, appropriate entity to associate as the creator of those moral laws. This leads us to what's called divine command theory. So divine command theory states that an act is morally required just because it is commanded by God, and immoral just because God forbids it. This gives us that foundation of morality. Why do what is right? Why follow moral laws? Well, because God said so. In fact, that's what moral laws are. They are simply commandments by God. Who has the authority to set up moral laws? Well, only God does. Schaefer Lando mentions that often this is considered the default view for religious believers when thinking about God's relation to morality. Let's consider some objections to this default view of, of religion. So the first series of objections that he gives deals with the concept of God itself. So we spent a lot of time in this course looking at various arguments for and against the existence of God, the thing that he wants to point out here is that if we're going to make God as the foundation of morality, well, that foundation itself is unreliable. That would make morality itself unreliable. Why? Well, it's at least possible that God doesn't actually exist. 
also perhaps God exists, but not in the same way that we generally think of God. Maybe there are these non-traditional notions of God. We've talked about previously about deism, this idea that God created the universe, is a universe creator, but then moves on and makes other universes. It's not so concerned with what we're doing in our daily lives. This deist notion of God doesn't command anything for us. He makes the universe, moves on, not worried about us. So perhaps God could be in this fashion. Once again, in that case, if divine command theory is correct, well, then there are no moral laws at all. Building on this is, well, this question of what version of God, you can then also ask, well, what commandments? What are what commandments are given by God? Which ones are not? Sure, there might be some similar commandments within various faiths, but there are some very different ones as well. How do we are, are we supposed to determine which ones are the correct ones? The second objection deals with what is called the Euthyphro dilemma. So let's assume that God does exist, or at least you have a firm conviction that God exists, perhaps based on some of the traditional arguments for theism. Then divine command theory does seem correct, it seems to follow from this, right? Well, maybe not. Uh, so Schaefer Lando says that even if you do believe in God, maybe you shouldn't automatically believe in divine command theory. Even if you believe in the traditional notion of this omni-god, a, a not a deist god, there are still objections to divine command theory that need to be addressed. The most prominent of which is called the Euthyphro Dilemma, named after a work by Plato written around 399 BC. In this dialogue, the character of Euthyphro states that piety is whatever is loved by the gods. So here they're talking about polytheism, so multiple gods, but we can still relate it back to uh, monotheism here in a moment. In response, Socrates, the main protagonist of many of Plato's dialogues, uh, Socrates states, do the gods love actions because they are pious or are actions pious because the gods love them? Well, we can e easily apply this to divine command theory by revising it. So Schaefer Landau revises it in the following fashion. He says, does God command us to do actions because they are morally right? Or are actions morally right because God commands them? We can develop this into an argument against divine command theory. The way that Schaefer Lando summarizes it is in the following fashion. So premise one is that either A, God has reasons that support his or her commands, or B, God lacks reasons for his or her commands. So either God has reasons or does not have reasons. So if it's option A, that God has reasons for commands, well, then these reasons, rather than divine commands are what make right and wrong actions right and wrong. So instead of saying the source of morality is God, well, ultimately the source of morality are whatever God's reasons are. Well, that would refute divine command theory. If actions are morally right just because God insists that we perform them prior to God's commands, nothing was right or wrong, well, then this would imply that God did not invent morality but rather recognized a pre-existing moral law, then commanded us to obey it. So we can see perhaps some similarities here with our discussion before of whether God can do uh, the non-logical. Does God have to follow logical laws? Well, we can think of it in a similar way. Does God have to follow moral laws? All right, so let's move to premise three. So if it's option B, so that God lacks reasons for God's commands, well, that seems to make God's commands arbitrary. If something is good only because God commands it, God could have easily commanded terrible things. If God just commands things for no reason at all, 
that doesn't seem like a good god either. That seems like you're just randomly dictating commands, and some would say that god, uh, that type of god would be imperfect. God, that type of god is arbitrary, just does things at random. This would undermine god's moral authority. So we'll come back to the Euthyphro dilemma in just a moment, but this leads us to another argument that Schaefer Lendo presents in the reading. He calls this the divine perfection argument. The divine perfection argument goes as follows. If the divine command theory is true, then a morally perfect God could have created a flawless morality that required us to rape, steal, and kill, and forbade us from any acts of kindness or generosity. So think of a much more barbaric world where the Ten Commandments told us to do absolutely awful things. And that's the way that we were supposed to live. Once again, what makes something right? What God says is right. So if God says that we should do these awful things, that's what we should do. That's how we should live. It goes on to say that a morally perfect God would not have issued such commands. So in premise two states that anyone who does issue such commands would be morally imperfect. So it's saying if we created such a world, if any being created such a world, such an awful world with such awful commands, that being is not an all good being. Therefore, the divine command theory is false. So perhaps you're not convinced, and maybe you uh, buy the divine perfection argument, and maybe you think that, you know, you know, you're okay with this idea that God could have issued such commands. He just didn't. He gave us the commands that we do have that enforce things like, uh, that state things like love your enemies, uh, pray for those that persecute you, and so on. A much more compassionate uh, list of commands. Well, this brings us back to the Euthyphro dilemma. If we say that actions are correct just because God commands them, that still seems to imply that they are arbitrary. They aren't based off of any reasoning. They're just there because God stated them. That still seems to make God imperfect. He's just set up a set of commandments that ultimately are completely arbitrary. They have no reasons behind them. So as uh, Schaefer Lando puts it, to avoid portraying God as arbitrary, we must assume that he issues commands based on the best possible reasons. This preserves God's omniscience and integrity, but it comes at the expense of divine command theory. So turning to premise five, it's saying that God isn't imperfect. God isn't going to just give us arbitrary things that we should do. God has reasons for everything that God commands. Well, if that's the case, then leads us to the conclusion that divine command theory is false. Schaefer Lando doesn't think that this should be something to dread, though, that it's okay to uh, abandon the divine command theory even if you're religious. He says that God does not need to be the author of morality, that abandoning divine command theory is actually needed in order to preserve God's perfection. He states that being perfectly wise, God recognizes the highest moral values. Being perfectly moral, God flawlessly follows these moral laws. As such, he cares for humanity. God then passes on this wisdom to us in various ways. That just because you say that God isn't the creator of morality doesn't mean that we have to give up on the notion of God or religion altogether. Just like with logical laws, we say that most theologians are fine with saying that God can't do the logically impossible. We can say perhaps a similar thing here, that God can't do what's immoral because they're moral laws. They are based off of good reasons, and we should follow them. Now this leads us to the third assumption. The third assumption is that religion is an essential source of moral guidance. That God shares God's perfect wisdom concerning moral laws with the religious in multiple ways. One, through direct revelation, speaking or giving signs to us individually. Or two, indirect revelation, inspiring authors of sacred texts. So 
this idea is that religion is this essential source of moral guidance because we can tap into God's guidance, God's infallible uh, views on what's right and wrong. So whether or not God is ultimately the source of morality, whether or not God created morality, nonetheless, God is a good authority on it because God is all good and all knowing. So of course, one would need to be religious to have full access to such guidance. Now Schaefer Landau presents what he calls some worries about this third assumption. So the first, or the first two, in fact, are similar to ones we saw previously. He states that those who are not religious will need to look elsewhere for moral guidance. He says, but perhaps they're right to do so. Once again, uh, he thinks that we don't have certainty, certainty of whether God exists or not. The second worry is that, similar to the objection we saw before, maybe God exists, but doesn't offer us any advice. His next worry states that in this case, we must select source, uh, a source of re religious wisdom from many choices. So there are many religions out there, and of, of, of these large groups of religions, such as Christianity or Islam or Judaism, there's a lot of different versions of those. So which one do we pick? Each one of them presents a different set of commandments that God gives us. And some of them have very significant differences on how we're, we live our lives. Then, of course, even if we pick a particular source, say we go with Christianity, we look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, well, there's a ton of disagreement on how to interpret that source. He gives the example of abortion. Abortion is very controversial within the religious community. Many will look to the Bible and say, look at certain passages and say that clearly this states that abortion is always wrong. Others claim, well, no, that's not the case. This doesn't what that this isn't what that passage means. This also is the case in terms of treatment of animals and perhaps things that simply could not have been addressed in the sacred text because, well, those technologies weren't around at the time, such as artificial intelligence. What are the moral implications of artificial intelligence? Well, the Bible can't tell us because it had it was not because it was not around when the Bible was written. That goes for many other technologies that we're developing today. So finally, let's look at Schaefer Lindo's conclusions. His conclusions on these three assumptions are as follows. So the question of, is God needed to ensure that we are morally motivated? He states, no. He says that the non-religious and non-believers can also have a love of morality and a dedication to follow moral laws. They can be inspired to do good works and perhaps live very decent lives, in fact, perhaps exemplary lives, even though they aren't religious. What about the second assumption? Does God create morality? His view is no, God does not create morality. If God exists at all, God understands moral laws just like God understands logical laws, and he uses them as a basis for his commandments. He has good, solid reasons for why he tells us to do what he tells us to do. Finally, this third assumption. Uh, so what about the question of does religion offer reliable moral guidance? So here he's at least open to the possibility. He says it's possible, but it depends on many things. So he says some of the assumptions that religious moral guidance is founded upon are as follows. One, that God exists. Two, that God speaks to us, offers us moral guidance. Three, that we can know what texts are divinely inspired. We can pick ones that are, that we have a way of picking which ones actually are inspired by God. Four, we can successfully defend interpretations of sacred texts. And finally, five, that we can resolve conflicts concerning traditions and authorities. What happens when your interpretation is different that, 
of what the religious authorities are saying. You know, that's happened throughout the, the ages, right? So at the very end of this reading, he says, all right, this list is a daunting list, but philosophy is full of such lists. The difficulty of the project is not by itself proof of its failure. It says that, sure, religious believers have their work cut out for them to give this full theory of why religion does offer more reliable moral guidance, but uh, so does basically everybody else. Uh, every, every ethical theory has a lot of questions, a lot of things that it needs to answer to make it a reliable source of moral guidance. So he's at least open to this possibility. He's not rejecting it outright, unlike those first two assumptions. So Schaefer Landau rejects those first two assumptions, but he thinks at least the third assumption is possible. What do you think? Do you agree with his arguments? Why or why not? I look forward to reading your responses to these concepts in the future.